I mentioned there was a missions conference, and when there's a local missions conference, God does this amazing thing about bringing some amazing missionaries from around the globe to one location. And uh, I found out that one of my dear friends, Ron Bishop, was in town. Ron, will you come join me up here? Everybody get up for Ron Bishop. You don't know him yet, but you will. Now, here's what you need to know about Ron. There was a very hyper... 10-year-old at a missions conference in San Antonio, Texas. And Ron and Christy Bishop prayed for that 10-year-old. They continued to encourage that kid. When he was in middle school, when he was in high school, he ministered to that kid when he was in Bible college. These guys have been part of my life for a long time. They have blessed me. They have blessed my children. And I'm just so grateful for their example in the faith. I'm so grateful for their ministry. And I've just invited Ron. Ron, come and share with our people. I love you, man. Thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want my wife to come. Christy. Christy and I met. We met on January 7th, 1970. And um, I was an evangelist. And I came through her church and wound up staying there for five years. But uh, we got married five weeks later than the day we met. And the reason we waited so long was because I wasn't 21. <laughs> so the day I turned 21, we got our marriage license. Because in that state, you had to, to, for the guy, you had to have his parents' signature if he wasn't 21. So I waited till I was 21. Had to wait a whole five weeks. <laughs> and then we got married on Friday the 13th, the day before Valentine's Day. So anyway, we're just so glad to be here. And I wanted Christy to greet you and whatever she wanted to say. Wonderful to be here and we're so happy for this church being in this neighborhood it looks like a lovely welcoming place and a beautiful facility and we're so happy for pastor casey to get to be here and brianna and the family and uh, i just want to say they're good people really good people and i know you people are good as well and uh, you know we become good when the Lord gets into our hearts, you know. Other than, other than that, there's nobody good. No, not one, you know. But when the, the goodness of God comes into our life, then we can be better people. And so I'm so thankful for Jesus. He's made such a uh, difference in my life since age 14. And then when I married Ron, he and the Lord both started stretching me a lot. I was a, from a small town, a country girl quiet maybe one friend at a time but i've been stretched <laughs> and that's a that's a good thing it's a wonderful thing so let the lord just use you and stretch you and god bless you thank you for receiving us thank you no go ahead. sorry i have to sit but um, a couple of years ago, we had come back from Germany, and uh, we had, were helping to start a Bible school. And from that point, I've had some neuropathy issues, and that uh, causes me to not have uh, quite the strength that I need. So anyway, just pray for me. Okay. Maybe uh, my name will uh, appear on one of these sometime. <laughs> I just really am glad to come here. And um, I was so excited when we saw that there was an opportunity to not necessarily be over in Wapaka for this morning, along with some of the other missionaries, but to be here and to be with uh, Casey and Brianna. I want to tell you, we're really proud of them and looking forward to, we're going to have Mexican food this afternoon. And uh, then we go on to Shell Lake and we'll be there for a conference and then on to... Um, uh, Hayward after that for a conference and then back here next Sunday to Wapaka and I'll be ministering there at the church 
But um, I'm just very grateful because of all that God has done, all that God has been saying to us. I just have been impressed as we drove into the city. I heard how that you're getting ready to have front and center location with the highway. I think that's wonderful, whichever way it is, I don't know. But I'm just very pleased at the footprint that uh, Casey and Brianna are going to have here in their sons. I, I was impressed with their sons and looking forward to getting a chance to know them a little bit better. Hopefully they'll be going to lunch with us today. So, uh, But uh, I just really thank God. I wrote a book called Is There a Grandfather in the House? And that book deals with transition. And one of the things that <laughs> one of the things that I find <clears throat> is that uh, the Lord helped me stop thinking about all the grandfathers and those of my peers, but I found myself looking at all those younger people who are the next generation of leaders who are about to take my place and the, their parents' place and about to give a strong voice of strength and encouragement and enlightenment to their generation and uh, how many times my ideas were great in their day when they were in vogue. But those ideas that this generation will have are going to amaze us all. And we'll look at them and we'll think, well, they just don't have the spazazz we had. Well, that's what you say when you've got strength. But when you look around and you realize that their generation requires their voice and not ours, it's going to amaze you at what God is able to do. And um, I'm just I'm thrilled at what I see here. I'm very glad to be here. You have a beautiful facility, and um, it's going to be interesting. Never been to Duper, Dupree? De Pere. De Pere. Never been here before. I've been probably driven by it on the highway. We've been to 88 countries, and we've lived, we've ministered on every continent except Antarctica. And funny enough, I had friends in Antarctica in the scientific community, but I didn't want to spend $40,000 to go there, and we couldn't have had an evangelistic meeting anyway. But um, in, in all these different continents, all these different countries, and uh, in every place, we have seen God move in such spectacular ways. What I'm going to do today is I'm going I'm to speak to you about, uh, there's a book I'm, I'm putting together. I've published five books, and one of them in Spanish. But I'm uh, working on five more at this point. And uh, one of the books I, I'm working on is Significant Friends of Paul. And talking about all the different, right now I'm about to finish one on uh, all those, the stories of the resurrected, everybody in the Bible who was resurrected from the dead. But as I tell the stories of uh, significant friends of Paul, I wanted to just mention, and uh, this is not a sermon I've put together, this is uh, just, uh, I'm pulling from different directions and wanted to share with you some of the thoughts that I have, and one of them is that one of the significant friends, two of the significant friends of Paul, were Aquila and Priscilla. And if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 18, and I want to read the first four verses of that chapter. Acts chapter 18, and um, as we look at this, why here Aquila and Priscilla were friends. They were, they, Aquila was from Pontus, which is in Turkey on the Black Sea. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I discovered, um, oh, a couple years ago, I discovered one of the things that um, I began to notice was a pattern of how God works generation to generation to generation. And way back in the days of, um, well, in, in Deuteronomy, he speaks of how that uh, this generation just seems like it wants to worship false gods, that, and that he had made this whole 
commandment of you shall serve no other gods before me. And yet Israel, who were God's chosen people, seemed to have a lust after other gods. And it happened so often, and finally even they wound up with David. And David, here he is, the king, and he was such a man up to God's own heart. And um, uh, I just uh, was impressed with David as I began to study his life. But after him, he came Solomon, and his son Solomon had struggles and allowed his wives. He had, I mean, he just, you know, had a small family. A thousand had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Uh, Solomon, he was something because he allowed some of those wives to turn his heart to other gods. And as wise as Solomon was, he was stupid. <laughs> it was amazing. And, but in, in all of this, his kingdom only lasts, it lasted 40 years. So Saul had been king 40 years. David was king 40 years. And Solomon was king 40 years. But at the end of Solomon's time, his son, um, Rehoboam, why he turned away from God and he, it was just such a difficult thing. And even though we know that Jesus was of the sons, one of the sons of David in the sense of to the next generation and uh, is still on the throne today, the fact was that, that uh, the kingdom was divided after Solomon died. And as the kingdom was divided, the nation went away from God. And finally, Jeremiah raises his voice and he says, uh, and, and if you read the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, uh, that verse has our fav one of the favorite verses of this generation was, and God knows the thoughts that he thinks toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil, uh, to, that you might have a good and an expected end. But if you will read not just that verse, 2911 of Jeremiah, but you will read the whole chapter. Try to read that when you go home today. You will be amazed because one of the things he says is this generation has turned away from God and they're walking in against him and walking to follow after false gods. And so therefore, uh, I will turn them over to my servant Nebuchadnezzar. And I will cause him to come in and take them away. They will be carried away to another land. And when they're carried away, they'll be gone 70 years. And as he made this proclamation, why, it's amazing. And he says, and when you go, he said, I want you to raise your families. I want you to set up businesses. I want you to settle in because God has you there. Because he's going to deal with your heart. Well, he did. But then after the end of that, when everybody goes back but Daniel and the three Hebrews and a lot of business people did not go back to Babylon, when Cyrus the Great turned them back, and I'm, I'm, I know I sound like I'm going off in all these different directions, but just stick with me for a few moments. And so he sent all of them, went back to Jerusalem, and all these, the temple was built, and the city was fortified, and God began to do some amazing things. But many of the businessmen said, you know what, we like it here in Babylon. And they decided that they would set up their businesses as Jeremiah had commanded, and Isaiah had also commanded. And as they set up these businesses, they decided now we'll just expand. And instead of going back to Jerusalem, they went to Alexandria in Egypt. They set up Jewish communities in Pontus, Turkey, in Rome, in, in about 40 different cities around the world of that time. They set up these, these um, Jewish communities. That became God's plan for world evangelism. So that whenever the apostles and all these people, they, they were kicked out of Jerusalem and persecution was coming after Jesus had been crucified. While all these business people who were in these different cities, like Apollos, 
Apollo was uh, um, Apollos was a man who was an uh, articulate Billy Graham, Billy Sunday sort of a guy. He had an articulate ability to communicate the Word of God so articulately. The only problem is he didn't know past the baptism of John. And that's where Aquila and Priscilla... Hey, let's read this, these verses here, okay? This is uh, Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, so Claudius was the Caesar of the day, and he kicked out all the Jews. There was a lot of disruption in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm sorry, in Rome. And with all the disruption, why the Jews who were anti-Jesus began to fight with those who were now believers of Jesus. And so as a result, this uh, Claudius said, one Jew is as bad as others. Seen one, seen them all. Kick them all out. And they all had to leave Rome. And so then they came uh, Aquila and Priscilla and these Jews, many of them came to Corinth. And um, so all the Jews departed from Rome and he came to them. So because he was of the same, because Paul was of the same trade as these two, Aquila and Priscilla, they were tent makers. Then uh, he began to stay, he stayed with them and he worked with them for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and, per, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So here is the scripture. So let me just begin again. So you've got Aquila and Priscilla that became good friends of Paul. They are, in all of the Bible, the only couple that work like a team. They're the only ones. And so if you had Aquila and Priscilla, they were working. It wasn't just the man, Aquila, was the preacher. They both were apostolic in their function, in their thinking. And they have set a standard. Uh, the, two of my Bible heroes are Aquila and Priscilla. He and his wife. And is this couple, they did not work separately. They were a team. You know, it says one can put a thousand to flight. Two can put ten thousand. And there was a man who, and I, I don't have the note in front of me, but there was a man who raised not these... Um, uh, stay, you know, the ones, the, the big horses that uh, pull the Budweiser beer. Clydesdale. Clydesdale. Thank you very much. Sorry about bringing Budweiser into that. But anyway, <laughs> these uh, Clydesdales, they are a, just a, an amazing animal. One, he said, this man who raised those types of animals said that one of these can pull two tons easily, but two of them can pull 20 tons. <laughs> Woo! Hey, that real, that's even better than the one can put 1,000 and two can put 10,000 to flight. It's amazing how God is able to use a camaraderie of two people working together with the same heart. It's amazing how God caused this team to be so effective that Paul, everywhere he went, he wanted them along. And so there were many of the cities that Paul went to, not everyone, but, and not for a long, long period of time, but for some time he had this couple with them because he just somehow felt at home with their hearts. And so as they began to minister, it was a beautiful picture. And at one point Paul even said, I, that they risked their lives for me. And so this couple who were, had gone to Rome, or to Corinth, and there they were, they set up this house, they set up this uh, where they would live, and they found a marketplace where they could do their tent 
making ministry and tents were the the way of the future of that day because you had different kinds of tents you had those made of goat skin and those made of a more of a canvas like the goat skin required a lot more equipment to carry with you whereas the ones of canvas, they could do it with uh, carrying the tools with them. So Paul always had his tools with him. And, uh, but it was, it's an amazing thing not to go into all of that. And even the Roman armies carried tents. And so there was a big uh, need that they were able to accomplish by choosing the line of tent making that they chose. And every young, every family, whenever they had a young man growing up where they would make sure he had a trade of some kind. And oh, some of them were butchers, some of them were other things. But tent making was a significant choice for them to make. And so as they did this, while well now Aquila and Aquila taught Priscilla the art of tent making. And then they worked together. And so you seen one, you saw them both. You never have ever mentioned just Aquila by himself. Uh, but it was always Aquila and Priscilla. You never have Priscilla mentioned by herself. It's always Priscilla and Aquila. And as a matter of fact, the first couple times that they're mentioned, it's Aquila and Priscilla, and thereafter it changed and it became Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, it's amazing how you were. Anyway, I could go into a whole lot about that. I may, uh, but there, there are only six verses about them in the Bible. But those six verses are so interesting when you put it in the context and then you read other Jewish uh, uh, materials and historians and people from back in the day and uh, read all of them together. Why, you would be amazed at what you would discover. And uh, actually, I think the significance of this couple as compared to some of the other friends of Paul. But God's God put together a level of friendships for Paul that he was able to turn the world upside down. It wasn't just Paul doing it, or rather his former Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus was one of those cities that the, the Jewish community went to. Do you know who Tarsus, you know who Paul was? Saul of Tarsus? He was a descendant of the Judas Maccabees from back in the 400 years between the... Testaments between the Old and the New Testament. And so in other words, this is not a simple story. It goes in so many directions. Now, I'm going to change gears, okay? I want to talk to you because I've talked about significant friends of Paul the Apostle, about the evangelism and all the things that were happening all over the world. But I want to talk about some of our experiences. Christy and I have been in mission work for 40 years. We've been uh, in ministry, I've been in the ministry 55 years, 56 years, and uh, we, were, we were married 54 years ago. But in our times of ministry, that has taken us to all these different countries all, and uh, all these different places, and we've met so many different people. And I thought I would like to share with you some of our significant friends some of the things we have experienced. And um, as I do, I, I would like to just uh, go back when God began to deal with us to go to the mission field. And uh, I'm, not, uh, this is, I'm not turning this into a mission service. I'm just uh, wanting to share with you some of the things that we've experienced and some of the people we have met and some of the exciting things that we have seen that are faith-challenging and life-changing. Uh, in 1984, we were getting ready to go to move to South Africa. And as we started to make this move, we'd been an evangelist, been doing, but we'd pastored uh, two churches, one in Connecticut, one in Atlanta. And then now, we were getting ready to go to the mission field. We told our kids one day, we had a travel trailer, we pulled it for five years, and I said, um, well, kids, we had a son and a daughter, and Cameron and Dory, and so I, we said to them, okay, we're getting ready to settle down. Well, I mean, we've been on the road for five years. Uh, they were 
thrilled we were going to settle down. And uh, so I said, uh, but uh, we're going to settle down in another country, South Africa. And uh, you'll have your own bedroom. I mean, that right then, they were sharing bunks. So he, he had the, the bottom bunk and Dory had the top bunk. And so we were, here we were in this uh, travel trailer, 25 feet of spacious room. And uh, we pulled that all over the country. And then we had gone to a fifth wheel. And so as, as we were doing this, we said, we're going to settle down. You'll get, you won't have air conditioning, but you'll get your own fan. <laughs> so they were quite excited about it. Didn't have a clue what was going on, but they were quite excited. And life became quite interesting. But I remember before my family went over with me to South Africa, I had to make a trip, and uh, I had several people who had invited us to come, uh, South Africans, uh, to come and take over a Zulu Bible college there. One of them was a man by the name of David Duplessis. Some of you may have heard of him. He's known as Mr. Pentecost, and uh, one of the greatest movers and shakers with the charismatic renewal that started about 1969, 1970. But David Duplessis and these brethren invited us to move to South Africa. And to, but after I went on this trip, I, we were, oh, I was over there in December of 1984. And um, I decided to go up while I, before I came back to the States fly up from South Africa to Harare, Zimbabwe. And that is the former nation of Rhodesia, and uh, which was then Salisbury was the name of the capital. But they had changed the name to Harare. So I flew in there. And my friends, Jerry and Gail Roselle from our home church in Maryland, why they, uh, they were there and they were... Uh, they had just done something that was just phenomenal. They had been given a Land Rover from Christ for the Nations, and so they had uh, gone into Zimbabwe as missionaries. They were heading up a, a Bible college called Living Waters, and they said, uh, you know, Jerry said, my mother read an article several years ago in National Geographic about a people called the ostrich people. Didn't know what that was. Didn't know much about it. There's something strange going on with their feet. Actually had three toes instead of five. They had three toes and the ostrich people who actually were the Vodoma people. If you've got a piece of paper, you might want to write on one of those blue pieces of paper you've still got with you. Write down V-A-D-O-M-A -A and Google it this afternoon. And you will find, don't Google it now. <laughs> but you can Google it this afternoon. And what you will see is feet that are odd. They're unusual. It's actually a genetic disorder. And it only affects men and only one-third of the men and not always both feet. And so what it is, it almost looks like a club foot, but it has three toes. They can't wear shoes. It's interesting, these people. And I've been there. And so these uh, Vodoma, or they called them then, Jerry was calling them the ostrich people, as National Geographic had pinned them. Why, Jerry said, I'm going to have to find these people. I don't know where they are, but they are a nomadic and a very, uh, a people who live in an out-of-the-way place, very remote. And he studied the map, and he asked people. Nobody had ever heard of them. And so he asked people, and uh, nobody could help him out there. So he studied the map, and he decided they. They could not be down toward Petersburg, which was going into South Africa, nor could they be off toward Victoria Falls and Wangi, uh, that area there. So he said, I think that logically they probably, a more remote area would be toward the Zambezi River Valley, and that would be with the uh, Zambia coming in and Mozambique coming in and uh, Rhodesia or Zimbabwe coming in. And so he thought 
Logically, I think I'm going to take this road. And he took that Land Rover Christ for the nations had given him, and they began to drive up that 13-hour gravel road. And they, they stopped at the first area where he could buy fuel, which was not a proper service station. It would be like 55-gallon drums with a pump on top of it, and you'd fill your tank up. And they had several 55-gallon drums, and then they would fill them up with gasoline. And so he did that. First one, the guy said, no, nah, I never heard of him. And they just kept on going. And then they came, finally came to one, and the guy said, uh, oh, yes, I've heard of them, but I don't know much about them. But I'll tell you what, I think you're going the right direction. Just keep on going. And so finally they got up there, and they came to this one uh, place where they could buy petrol. And as they pulled in there while he said, uh, they told the guy what he was looking for, and he said, oh, yes, the, they're the, the ostrich people, but they're actually called the Vodoma. And he said, if you will go up to the border patrol station on the side of the Zambezi River, then you will find behind that is a, uh, a village. And if you'll go to that village, you will be able to find the chief problem. He probably won't want to help you. He's not a very good man, not a very nice man, but he probably won't want to help you. But you can go to, if you can go to him, I think it, you will find just what you need. <laughs> and so Jerry, <clears throat> off they went, found the border patrol station. And right behind it was this village. And he walked in, they came into the village and they looked around and, um, uh, they, they didn't, uh, they saw no one there except there was a house of sorts. It's like a cabin, I um, mean like a, uh, an African hut. And it was off in the distance and he saw a man standing outside the door. So he came to that man and he said, uh, I'd like to see the chief. And the man said, uh, uh, no, you can't see the chief. His wife is busy dying. And that's a term you use when you're on your deathbed. She's busy at this thing called dying. <laughs> and so they went up and say, he said, uh, well, I've come to see his wife. That's what Jerry Roselle said to them. I've come to see his wife. I want to speak to his wife. And the man looked at him and he went in, he said to the chief, told him what this stranger outside wants to speak to his wife. A white man wants to speak to his wife. And so they decided to bring him on in. So Jerry went in. When he walked in, he walked over to his wife and he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and be healed. She sat full right up in bed. And she said, I'm hungry. <laughs> and she was healed totally. And the chief, this man who's not going to want to cooperate, turns and he says, is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> and Jerry said, yes, I'd like to meet the ostrich people. They called them the Vedoma. And he said, now this is a, uh, a remote tribe of people who did not have the gospel at all. And this was 1982 when this had happened. And so he said, I'd like to meet the Vodoma. And he said, uh, the man outside can help you. And he called the man in and told him, take them to the Vodoma so that they may find him. So it was a, they drove for a while and then they got out of the Land Rover and had to walk for an hour and as they're walking along, it's Jerry Roselle, uh, his wife Gail, and also Patrick, a young, tall, Shona student and uh, with them. And so the three of them and then the God. They talked among themselves and they realized that none of them knew the language of the Vodoma. Nobody was going to be able to speak to them in a language they would understand. But we're going. So they were going. And um, so as they were going, why, uh, Patrick all at once, he said, I've got it, I've got it. And they said, 
What have you got? And he said, I've got the language. God just gave me the language. And <laughs> when Patrick, when they met the Bedoma, Patrick was able to speak to them like he was born the next hut over. I met Patrick. It was interesting. As a matter of fact, he was one of my interpreters when I visited the Bedoma. And so we flew up on a mission aviation plane and we, we uh, uh, were able to see the crocodiles down in the Zambezi River and we landed and the people would come uh, they were coming over the hills a uh, little look like uh, chocolate drops these hills some of them as they would come over them the paths where the path went and then they would continue on their way till they came together so anyway uh, it was fascinating because here we were uh, the, or here Jerry was, and they, they came to the Vidoma, and when they came, these people had never heard the gospel, didn't know anything about what they were talking about, but Jerry began to talk to them, and he taught them, and he taught them, and then finally he said, um, I think we need to now that you, uh, a number of them had given their hearts to the Lord and uh, believed what this missionary had to say, and then, so he said, okay, I want you to, uh, I want to baptize you in water in the name of the Lord. And so as he wanted to do this, they all backed away. They don't do baths in the Zambezi River with the crocodiles. <laughs> it's, don't do that. And they, so, you know, water and baths were kind of an uncommon thing. They didn't know them so well. And so it was amazing how uh, they all backed away. But then the chief, and I met him, and he had both feet like the Vidoma feet I was talking about. And so he, he stepped up and he says, I will be the first to die. <laughs> you see, death, burial, and resurrection, which is what the baptism is all about, meant something a little different when you get the languages confused. <laughs> and so here they were, and there, he is saying, I want you to come, I'm going to put you down, and death, you will be resurrected to newness of life, for you with me. And as he was doing this, and only the chief picked up on, I'll be courageous enough to allow this white man to do this thing to me. I am an African. And, and, and I'm telling you what, it, it's... Uh, Fascinating, And when you move in as a, a Westerner, you move into the world of the, the uh, uh, native peoples of many cultures of the world. It's amazing how God can really uh, cause your values to so be adjusted that you can appreciate them just as much as if you were, were brothers of the same mother. <laughs> And so it's, it was so amazing. And so this man, he, Jerry, was able to, And what they do is they take the banana trees and they take the leaves and they go out there and you get a semicircle and they will beat the water and that keeps the crocodiles away. And so uh, they did that and baptized this chief. And when, when he was about to go down, they all rushed forward to watch. They wanted to see him die and what would happen. And, and then they, Jerry pulled him out of the water, didn't leave him down very long, and <laughs> pulled him out of the water. And uh, so he was alive and they were all ready to be baptized. So I thought that was just an interesting experience. Uh, about, I'm not sure exactly when it was, I can't remember, but about five or six years ago, Christy and I decided that we were going to go to Africa, but this time instead of flying into Zambia or we've been, there are 54 nations of Africa and uh, it's, 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 some people call it the country of Africa. No, it's, that's not the case. It's a lot larger than North America, for example, but uh, you have 54 nations and so what happened is uh, we decided, and we've been to about half of those nations and so they decided, uh, we decided we'd go into Zambia and then we would get friends, instead of flying from country to country, we would get friends to drive us to the border and another friend would pick us up from that country and carry us on 
through that country administering into various uh, things we had planned and then take us to the next border and another friend would pick us up. And so we had Zambia and, and, and uh, Zimbabwe and then we had uh, Botswana and South Africa. So as all of this was happening, we decided we would, we would go and we, we got as far as the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. And that's where Victoria Falls is. And uh, part of Victoria Falls is on one side of the river and, I mean, of the border and part on the other. So as we came to that point, why uh, Lester and Peggy Seiler picked us up there. And then we ministered in their country. Uh, we were doing all these things. And we came to a place where we actually need to be picked up and carried to the Botswana border. Uh, they assigned a stranger whom we did not know there, and this stranger, his name uh, was Amos Dick, and we did not know Amos. He was African. He's about 35 or so years old, maybe 40, and um, he and his wife Ethel, and we were driving along. He's an apostle. He has a tremendous work in Zambia and Zimbabwe, and so as we're driving along, I said to him, uh, Amos, we've just met. I don't know anything about you. Please tell me, what is your story? <laughs> Amos, this articulate, well-spoken man, says to me, well, I was born deaf and mute. And I said, you've got my attention. What's, what's your story? And he said, well, when I was eight years old, he said, I was unable. I'd never heard a sound of any kind. You could clang drums at my head, and I wouldn't have detected it if I didn't turn around and look at it. I couldn't speak. I'd never spoken a word. And he said, um, I was born in Shinoi, and so he said, um, one day, my parents came and got me. I feel them from behind me, but I don't know what's happening. And they directed me to the bus, and the whole family got on the bus, and we went to Mosvingo, another city there. When we did, he said, um, we got there, and there was a big tent. I don't know tents. I don't know, music, singing, clapping. I, he didn't know any of that, didn't hear it. So he said, I was playing with my friends, the ones I had just met, in the back of the tent. But in the meantime, there was a man by the name of Robert Mag uh, of um, Richard Ingetti, who was the, uh, an apostle. A Zulu apostle. We used to have a Zulu Bible college. When we moved to South Africa, we were going to work with Richard Ngeti. That was our plan. He died just before we got there, so we never did get to work with him. But I did work with him in tent meetings when I visited the country. And so as he did, he, he said Richard Ngeti was behind the platform, getting ready to come up onto the platform and to minister. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, there's a young boy here. He is deaf and mute. Call him forth and I will heal him. <laughs> ah, well, he came up on the stage. Now, R R uh, Amos Dick is in the back and he's playing with his kids, with his friends. And he doesn't know until his parents came up behind him and directed him toward this African man who had his hand out. And he said, he didn't know what had happened. He didn't know any of this. And he said, as I went forward, he said, they kept pushing me forward, forward. And finally, when he touched my head, my ears exploded. My ears exploded. I heard all these sounds. Nothing made sense. I didn't understand with all this that was going on. <laughs> he said, I had never spoken a word, but my tongue was loosed. Oh, he was, 
He said it was the most amazing experience. And I was eight years old. It took a couple years before he could learn both the language, learn his name, what a name was, why he was branded a man named Amos, and why everything was in its place. And finally I was able to communicate and talk and communicate with my family and friends and life took on a normality. When a kid is born in a village in Africa and he can't speak and he can't hear, why bother with a birth certificate? So he said, I finally was brought before the magistrate. My mother brought me there and standing before the magistrate, he said, boy, what's your name? He said, my name is Amos. He said, what's your last name? He didn't know what that meant. He said, um, what's your daddy's name? His name is Dick. <laughs> he didn't come up with a last name like Masvingo or, or uh, Huk Hukamula or something. <laughs> he didn't come up with anything like that. He just said, my daddy's name is Dick. Fine, your name is Amos Dick. He's the only Amos Dick in all of Africa. <laughs> He's the only man with that last name in all of Africa. And so it was just fascinating. And, uh, and then the years had passed, and God had done so many things in Amos' life. And now we've met him. It's fascinating. And uh, I think um, I want to tell you one more story. And that is um, a friend of ours, Scott Parsons from Indiana, and his wife were... Uh, teaching in Black Forest Academy in uh, Germany and we were, our daughter was a student there with them and we were living in Condern, Germany. We lived there for several years and they uh, uh, called, uh, so d d d Scott went to visit another friend of ours, Brian Thomas, in Omsk, Russia. And uh, India, you, if you can find it easily, in India, the top of India comes up like this, like an arrow, and it points toward Omsk in Siberia. And so that's how you find it. And uh, so one day uh, Scott had for Brian, because Brian was living there, he had dug this trench, and this trench was um, like two feet wide, and it was about uh, several feet long, and he's trying to get it so he could put in water. But he, he said, man, I'm so exhausted. I've been digging this thing for hours and hours, and I don't know what to do. And so the, the guy said, so Brian said, well, I, you know, I don't know what to do. He brought him some lemonade. He said, I need to sit down for a while. And then he said, what I need is a backhoe. And Scott's a great guy. He's a great friend of ours. He's a member of the Harley Owners Group. He uh, drives a Harley Davis. He has long hair, and he's the only guy I know looks okay with an earring. <laughs> but he's, he's a, like a pirate. But Scott's something else. But here he was there in, Germ in uh, Russia. And uh, he said, what I need is a backhoe. And Brian said, listen, I've lived here eight months. I have never seen a backhoe. And I don't think this village has one. And Scott said, we, then we need to pray one in. And he said... Uh, Pray one in. Yes, we need to pray right now. He said, Scott, I'm exhausted. I'm going to sit here and rest a few minutes while you pray. And so Brian said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Scott needs a backhoe so he can dig this hole so much faster than his back is able to stand. And uh, they ended the prayer. Scott raised his head, turned around, and there's a backhoe coming down the road. <laughs> How <laughs> this happened, folks? I want to tell you something. The God we serve. I remember watching The Chosen last week. And we were watching season four, episode four. And Peter, Simon Peter, says, uh, says um, to Thomas, he said, My God walks on water. <laughs> he made that statement in The Chosen. And I thought, 
My God, I, I got a piece of paper. My God walks on water. It's amazing how whenever you have a need, don't just assume he cannot help you. But he can absolutely meet your need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what. I love to tell stories. I could, I could probably take here, uh, take about uh, another hour or two and two or three hours and share more stories, one right after the other. But I feel like that, uh, that's basically what I wanted to share with you today. Paul had significant friends. God used that network of friends and he touched the world. God wants to use your network of friends to touch the world today. Hallelujah. Pastor. What Ron doesn't know is we've been teaching through the book of Acts over the last couple oh, of months. That's good. And sometimes we can forget these are not just stories. The reality is that we serve a God of power today. That God is still the God of miracles, still the God of miraculous provisions, still the God of circumstances beyond our thinking, beyond our imagination to build his kingdom. And I want us to be encouraged, to be stirred in our faith. This is not just something he does overseas. It is who our God is. And never forget, he is a God of power. He is a God of might. He is a God that will move heaven and earth to reach the lost, to show this world how amazing he is. This is what he does. Ron, thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us of this. Sometimes we can get so busy and we get into our, our church routine, we forget the powerful God that we serve. So I think that was a pointed reminder, and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, before you dismiss, I have a couple of quick announcements. The first one is this. This Saturday, we are having a special event here. It is the Flannel Festival. Now, what on earth is this? It is a harvest party of harvest parties, all right? We are renting some inflatables. We will have a bonfire. We'll have activities and games. And we want you to come and participate. It's an opportunity to invite your grandchildren or your neighbors to come and just participate in some fun. We will be uh, crowning the flannel prince and princess. So wear your best flannel. You never know who's going to get put into that pool. Also, there's going to be a chili cook-off. We'd love for some people to sign up and say, hey, I will cook some chili, and uh, we can see who can make the uh, better chili than me. It's not that hard, actually. Trust me. Um, so that is coming up this Saturday. Again, it's supposed to be a family event. It's a community event. It's an opportunity for the church to gather, to fellowship. And again, that's from noon to four, right here, on, just literally right back here on our field. You'll see the giant inflatable. So come and participate with us. Also coming up in just two weeks is our youth fall retreat. Youth, ages 13 to 18, I want you to come and spend a weekend focusing on your relationship with Jesus Christ. You get away, don't worry, fun will be covered. I'm not going to even tell you about the fun, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. When you get away, when you, when you separate yourself from the busyness of life and you focus on that relationship, there's always a new level you can grow into. And that is the challenge of life. And I want to take our youth on this retreat um, could use uh, two adult uh, volunteers or two adults that like to go as chaperones, come talk to me. But we'd love to take our youth. That's happening in two weeks. Last announcement is voting begins next week, right? Early voting. Outside, we have a table. On that table is some voting guides. If you wanted to take one of those voting guides and share it with someone, we need to be informed about who we're voting for and where they stand. And that, what I like about those voting guides, it's a clear yes or no on so many important topics that matter to us. But here's something that a number of my pastor friends are doing, and I want to challenge you as a congregation. Would you call five to ten other God-fearing God-loving people, and just remind them to vote. Remind them to get on a vote because the enemy is trying to convince the church that our vote doesn't matter. The lies that our country is so far gone, why should we matter? And the church had 21 million people, 21 million people who call out upon the name of the Lord did not vote in the last presidential election. Our world could be very different if the church opens its eyes and say, hey, let's go vote biblical values. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to tell you who to vote for. I'm going to say vote biblical values and it will change our nation. 
All right, so here's the challenge. Call five to ten of your friends. Just say, hey, are you voting? If they're not, kick them in the rear. Say, we need your representation in the polls because if those who love God will vote, our future can be very different. Do you agree with that? Awesome. Flannel Festival, Youth Fall Retreat, vote. Amen? All right, Father, I pray. Bless your people. Give them favor. Lord, stir our faith. May we believe you for big things, oh God, because you are a big God that does amazing things. Have your way. Lord, I just pray you bless Ron and Christy as they go from here. Give them traveling mercies and continued favor. Lord, I pray you heal the seropathy in Ron. In Jesus' name, touch his body. It's not something he has to live with. We have victory over these things. In Jesus' name, we ask you to heal him. And Lord, be with your people as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. May the Lord bless you. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't faced by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care of me.